Hello, and thank you for joining us for another Westwood Trust Creative Chat. My name is Claire Williamson, and I am the Director of Education and Community Engagement at Society for the Performing Arts. To describe myself and my surroundings, I am a white woman with long brown hair pulled back and dark rim glasses. I'm wearing a black top with kind of flutter sleeves, and there is a plain white wall behind me. I'm thrilled to be hosting this conversation today between Will B. of Black Violin and DJ Flash Gordon Parks, ethnomusicologist here in Houston, Texas. Black Violin is led by classically trained string players, Will B., who plays viola, and Kev Marcus, who plays the violin. Joining them on stage are DJ SPS and drummer Nat Stokes. The band uses their unique blend of classical and hip hop music, often described as classical boom, to overcome stereotypes and encourage people of all ages, races, and economic backgrounds to join together and break down cultural barriers. The group advocates for educational outreach and in the past 12 months have performed for over 100,000 students in the U.S. and Europe. Black Violin's Impossible Tour spreads the message that anything is possible and that there are no limits to what one can achieve, regardless of circumstance. Jason Woods, aka DJ Flash Gordon Parks, is an ethnomusicologist based in Houston, Texas. He is an accomplished photographer and resident DJ across various genres. As a DJ, he strives to educate his audiences through carefully curated selections. He's also a collector, documentarian, and passionate lecturer and advocate for the importance of Houston's rich music history. Catch him at his newest collaborative effort, the restaurant Mo Better Brews, anytime in the museum district. Before we delve into the conversation, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the many indigenous communities that have long used and continue to use this land as a living and gathering space. SPA's offices in Jones Hall are located on ancestral land traversed by the Karankawa, Atakapa Ishak, Sana, Kualwitekan, and Alabama Kushara people. These indigenous communities continue to be a driving force in shaping the culture and economy of our region. We acknowledge them to offer recognition and respect for their lived experience and to broaden awareness of the forces that have led to this moment. It is now my pleasure to bring on the folks having our conversation today. Welcome DJ Flash Gordon Parks and Will Baptiste of Black Violin, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, well, very, very honored to uh, have this chat with you, man. Um, just want to get some initial information about, you know, how you came up. Now, were you born in uh, Florida? Actually, I was. I was born in the islands in the Bahamas, but I came okay. here. I was about. I was about ten years old, so I've been here for a minute. <laughs> Okay, yeah. So musically, being from the Caribbean, being from the islands, um, how how did that you know shift coming to the U.S. and like hearing stuff that was here lo uh, locally where you're from? Well, I was uh, my parents, uh, my family's from Haiti, but I was born okay. in Bahamas. So in Bahamas, you know, I grew up listening to a lot of reggae and calypso, but I did listen to some top, you know top 20 top 40 hip-hop dude you know what i mean like i was i remember just listening to will smith you know um okay. you know pop pop records back in the days but i was heavily reggae and calypso but coming here into the states it was it was definitely very different um musically i think i was exposed to a lot more you know what i mean and and um when i came here i started i picked up the viola maybe a few years after and that was just another level of just like whoa you know what i mean because it's just i was never ever really exposed to classical music at all. So to be able to, you know, pick up this instrument, which was very foreign to me, it was it was kind of cool, you know? It's something that, you know, I've seen it before, I, I've heard of it, but never really seen it up close. So to be able to pick it up and, and learn how to play, it was very, very interesting. And, you know, and moving to South Florida and 
Miami bass and just like the vibe down south. It was just all that music, man, <laughs> and classic music. And I think our early years of black violin, our music really, really, we grabbed all these different elements and put it in one little pot, you know what I'm saying? Because you listen to our early music, it's, it's, it's heavy bass, but then you got that beautiful violin on top of it, you know? Okay, man, that's interesting. So can you talk a little bit about how you and Kev uh, met, uh, you know, what was the intersection for you guys coming together? We went to high school together. You know, he, okay. was a, he was a grade up. He was a sophomore and I was a freshman when we met. And um, and that was that was pretty much it. We were stand partners. We were both violists at the time. And, um, and we were just, you know, two kids that just loved playing these instruments. And we were pretty good at it, you know what I'm saying? We would go in and play competition. We kind of we kind of made each other better without even realizing it, you know what I'm saying? I wanted to kind of like beat him and vice versa, you know what I'm saying? So had a little bit of the friendly competition, but that made us, you know what I'm saying, iron sharpens hard, iron, so to speak. So we, we made ourselves, made each other better. And that's kind of how, you know, our early years, how we grew up. And, you know, we kept in touch after after high school, went to college. And we came back together after college and started producing and working with artists. You know what I mean? Like our idea was we wanted to be the, the the next big music producer. We wanted to be the next Neptunes or Timberland because we sure. grew up listening to these producers. So, and we wanted to incorporate classical music like no one's ever done. You know, and that was the whole idea, man. Just just doing that and playing the violin on top of the hip hop beats wasn't new to us. We've always done it. It was just always fun. But to actually make the beats and do it and to see the reaction of people, you know what I mean? To to do a show with a with a, a rapper in South Florida and we in the back playing the violin and people looking at us like, what's that? You know what I'm saying? That was just very different for us because we didn't think people really liked that kind of stuff. And that's right. why we started and that's what we started doing. We started focusing on us. You know what I mean? Instead of us being in the background. You know, we say, hey, let's just put ourselves in the forefront, man, to see what happens. You know what I'm saying? And that's what happened. We never looked back, you know? Now, I'm curious, at the time that you guys decided to um, work together and have this fusion of classical and hip-hop, um, were there anybody um, else around to influence that? Or um, was, like, uh, Marie ben Ari? doing her thing with Kanye but after or before or like you know how how did this um like just you know spark to you guys like this is it this is the lane that we should travel right right there there definitely wasn't any any influence you know Mary Bernari was something that came a little on after and this is it was in the middle of us just doing shows in South Beach like we didn't we didn't think anyone was doing this you know Okay. And again, we, we were doing this since high school, just having fun, you know what I mean? And and I credit hip hop for it. It wasn't necessarily something that we thought about. We woke up like, oh, let's put these two genres together. It just, it never happened that way. It happened organically. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, hip hop, that's what it's about. It's about being free and being who you are. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Hip hop is a rebel in a sense. You know what I mean? Classical music is very constrained. It's very, you know, you got to do it this way. You got to do it that way. And hip hop is literally the opposite, you know what I'm saying? Like, do you, you know what I'm saying? So for us, we were immersed in the hip hop world. So it was very, very natural for us to take the two worlds and just kind of blend them. Cause it was, it was almost like, it was almost like you shouldn't do that. Okay, then we're going to do it. You know what I'm saying? Like not really thinking about it. So that's kind of how it came about. And, um, you know, for us, it just, it was just a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun coming to school, playing something that someone heard on the radio. And they're like, oh, that's crazy, you know? Right, right, <laughs> It was right. just fun for us, you know? Yeah, I mean, I can imagine that reaction, especially being from the South, you know, me being from Houston, you, um, you know, landing in Florida, a lot of similarities in terms of, you know, style-wise, in terms of what people are accustomed to. So to have something unique like that, but also something familiar for them to grasp onto. I can imagine what that, you know, reaction was like. But I'm curious to know um, from that point, like what was the big break? What was what was the the defining moment that took you guys from Florida to, you know, traveling around the world and, and being able to play with so many notable artists? 
Well, the, the, the thing that happened was, I think, uh, Apollo, right? So we send out a tape in 2002. Basically, it was Kevin and I in the middle of the living room, my little studio and apartment. And we just put a medley together, like a 10-minute medley of just, you know, hits on the radio. And we just played on top of it. And this is what we would do at the clubs. We just played on top of it, and we sent it out to Apollo. And Apollo hit us up, like, literally a year and a half later, saying we, they want us to come and compete in, in Harlem. And um, we didn't think nothing of it. It was kind of cool to because we grew up watching Apollo. And... And we went there and we just won the whole thing. Never lost, you know? Wow. It was very unexpected for us. We didn't think that. And Harlem is one of those, you, you know, you know, Harlem, they're they going to give it to you. If they don't like you, they're going to let you know. And, Absolutely. and it was such an overwhelming um, response of just like people just loved it that we realized, oh, man, this is it. I think we were doing it before because. Honestly, in a lot of ways, classic music kind of faded away after September 11th. So for us, it was just a way to kind of like make a little extra bread, just performing at the clubs and stuff. But mm. when we did Apollo and realized that if Apollo loves you, then the world must will love you too. So that's when we really realized that we had something special. And we just, you know what I'm saying, we just started running with that, you know what I mean? And, you know, I remember we won $20,000 a week took ten thousand dollars and, and and build a website <laughs> you know what i'm saying huh. if you can imagine the back then websites were really expensive wow. so we spent 10 g's just to build a website and we started focusing on us as artists and started you know doing showcases and 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 touring and and started putting our show together you know I mean, that was the that was the biggest thing for us we wanted to put an actual show together and it became something where we had to put 20 20 minute show together we had to put 30 minutes and it became 45 minutes an hour. Now we're doing 90 minute shows and we're trying to figure out what we could, could we got to cut certain things because we got so much material now. So, so, you know, it just, it was one of those, it's one of those things, man, you know, we look back at it, man, and it just, you know, we're very, very thankful and, and blessed and to just be able to do something that we love. And, um, and, it, and we inspire people at the same time, you know? Absolutely. Um, so I want to kind of dig a little deeper because, um, you know, checking out your work and, and visually what you guys represent, especially with the project stereotypes, um, where you kind of delve into, you know, like race and, and the variations of, you know, people on the planet who are sort of marginalized or put in this box. And for two black men from Florida um, making this bridge between classical music and you know hip hop which of course hip hop is <clears throat> the culture at large is something that was started by black and brown people which we know um but now it's it's universal and the world connects to it and, and speaks the same language is probably rap music is probably the most um influential and and connector worldwide and for you guys to be able to take something, you know, at like classical music and bring that to the forefront with the with a present um, genre that's that's sweeping the world. I'm curious to know, like, how are how is the response when you're in front of audiences that don't quite look like you, um, you know, to 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 play this music and to be where you're from and represent it in such a way on both levels like being masters of of the classical genre as, and you know represent hip hop to the fullest like how does that how does that work um you know it's interesting cuz we perform like you said we perform all over the world particularly this country man we perform every single state every major city so we we get all sorts of different kind of crowds and we love it you know and we go to certain places that are majority, you know, white folks that don't necessarily look like us, but you know what I'm saying? And honestly, those crowds are very, very welcoming. You know what I'm saying? They're very open. It's hip hop and it's classical. So a lot of time we go to a venue, they don't know what to expect. They hear, oh, there's a violin concert. And we come in and, and we hit them, <laughs> we hit them hard because they're subs, they're subs rattling. You know, it's, it's still a very hip hop loud, but 
violins, you know what I'm saying? Um, and, and I'm doing vocals as well. So, so the reception is, they receive it very well. Cause I think in a lot of ways, I think a lot of it has to do with just our connection to, to who we are, where we come from, it, it's translated into the music. And like you mentioned stereotypes, that's who we are. You know what I'm saying? Playing this instrument, it's always been a situation where we kind of had to show people that, yeah, we do this. You know what I'm saying? Like right. even traveling and having this case, having this case on my back, you know what I'm saying? We obviously we get asked the question all the time, what's in this case? You know what I'm saying? Sometimes I play with them like, what do you think is in this case? They never guess, they never really guess an instrument. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes they guess something else. And and when they do guess an instrument, they're they're guessing trombone, trumpet, whatever, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, even piano, you know, wow. how I'm gonna fit a piano in this thing, yeah. But um, but but the thing is it's all right. It's okay. Historically, this is what it is. And for for us, from our standpoint, we're we're coming up on stage, and the individuals that are in the audience right now may not look like us, but the way that we are, the way that we represent ourselves, we are everyone else that look like us. You feel me? So when when they look at us, for that hour and a half, we hope that the stereotypes and the misperception that they have in their minds, based on how this person looks on stage. It's completely shattered, you know what I'm saying? Because I'm gonna play this instrument, and when I play it, it's going to show you that man, this person studied this, this person actually knows how to play this. You know what I'm saying? Especially an instrument that has always been held to this higher standard, you know what I'm saying? Especially this instrument that has always been seen and known to be to belonging to a certain type of people, you know what I'm saying? And the person like me who they would presume maybe that I'm doing something other than this, you know what I mean? So the idea of me playing this and, and not only that, you know, but I'm doing it and I'm and I'm representing my my culture at the same time. You know what I'm saying? The, you know, it, it's something that can really it, it messes with their minds. And I love doing that. You know what I'm saying? I love messing with your mind. I love I love you coming to the to the to the venue, not knowing what to expect having a little bit of reserve, even in the first 10 minutes, but at the end of the show, you're going to be standing up with your hands up and you're going to buy a t-shirt at the end of the show. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I love that. You know what I mean? Because for that hour and a half, I got you and I'm going to get you. You know what I'm saying? And if I don't get you, that's something, there's something internally that you need to deal with. That ain't, that's nothing for me to hold. You know what I mean? That's something that for you to deal with because at the end of the day, what I am and what I represent is I represent the people. I represent the ones that are marginalized. I represent the ones that are always being seen, always being put in the box. That's who I represent because I am them. I am that person, you know what I'm saying? I felt it and I've dealt with it. So, and um, and it's nothing that I feel sad about. It's nothing that, that I, um, you know, I, I mope about, man. It, it's a responsibility and I take on it. You know what I mean? I put it on my back and I, you know, I make it happen every, every night I'm on stage. And I'm just blessed to be able to do it. You know what I'm saying? I think about all the grace that that sacrificed uh, Muhammad Ali of the days. I'm not Muhammad Ali or or the activist. I'm not an activist per se, but I think it is something that we do on stage, and I think it it, it adds to it. And um and I and I take on it, man. I, and I and I take on the responsibility, and I'll do it every day. No, I I agree 100. percent Um, you know, I think it's great, especially. I know you guys do a lot of uh, outreach with young people and, you know, students and, you know, sort of a, a musical educational component to what you're doing, which I think is awesome as well, because young people need to see these types of examples of, you know, the possibilities, you know, a fusion of, of genres. Uh, of course, hip hop made every genre important and relevant again and so for you guys to kind of keep classical music alive in that way um you know <clears throat> it might inspire someone to do the same for the blues and jazz you know to other genres that aren't as popular as they used to be but can possibly find some resurgence you know by the example that you and kev are doing um i want to ask you a couple of more questions before we wrap up here um being that you guys are you know on tour and coming to houston 
um, which we're really excited about. Um, do you have any any knowledge about Houston music or are there any connections that you'd like to make, um, you know, while you're in the, in the city performing? Um, for me, when I go to Houston, I just like to go around. I have some, some folks that's there that, that I can visit. And I like to just kind of go in, in the city, in the town and just kind of just walk around, get some, get some good food. Um, you know, musically, you know, I'm trying to think of a, an artist out of Houston. It's funny, the last time I was in Houston, actually, this is before, this is a few, few times, this is way back, you know what I'm saying, when the inauguration was in Houston, you know what I'm saying? And, um... So it was kind of it was cool. I mean, I love Houston. I love I love just Dallas, Houston. I love those areas. Um, and I think going to Houston is always it's always fun. The crowd come out. You know what I'm saying? You know, Houston is very similar to like when I go to Memphis. It's just the energy. Energy of the South is just different, man. It's just different. Yeah. And um, and musically is different. The history is different. And um, and uh, I'm here for it, man. <laughs> so it's gonna be fun. No, nah, man, we appreciate, you know, having you guys come and, you know, give us some of that, you know, that flavor that you that you come with. Um, what what projects are you are you pushing out in 2022? Um, any new music, any new releases on the on the horizon? Well, right now we're trying to wrap up this tour. And as soon as we wrap up this tour, we're probably going to hit the studio. You know, we're going to for a lock ourselves in for a couple of weeks in the studio and try to work on a probably i don't know if it's going to be a record or just a few few songs trying to push out a single maybe like the the early fall or something like that so we don't know exactly what it is but we are going back in the lab because it's about that time you know to go back in the lab and start start cooking up some stuff so but yeah always look out you know what i'm saying social media website blackviolent.net to see what's you know what we cooking up man yo well i appreciate your time man um thanks for sharing your your journey with us um we look forward to the to the show um and all the all success to you and kev you know as you push forward and and innovate man um i'd be interested to see you know what else you guys can do you know with that instrument man it's, it's such a, a delicate thing but um you know from what i've seen in the performances i was able to catch um you guys are really masters at what you're doing and i just want to you know give you much respect on that and and you know goodwill good luck moving forward appreciate it man appreciate the talk um yeah man it's, it's amazing honestly it's just uh i'm just appreciating loving the journey thus far and it's just it's just beginning man also, we got a foundation, blackviolentfoundation.org, and it's one of those things that we love doing, just giving back to the kids and, and really giving the kids access and opportunities that we had growing up. So, shouts out to that. But, um, yeah, man, we're excited to be in Houston. Are you going to be able to do anything with kids while you're going to be here? Because of uh, COVID, because we typically would. We normally do, like, a, either a workshop or we do, like, at least like a little beat and greet or have the kids watch the soundtrack, something. Okay. Because of COVID, how things are, restrictions are. So we'll see what we can do, but um, it's all case to case basis. We'll see. Okay. All right. Thank you, Will. Yes. Thank, thank you, both. brother. Thank you. Thank you, um, DJ Flashboard Parts. And thank you, Will, so much for joining us today. This was a wonderful conversation. Just such a joy for me to be able to listen in um, to the two of you chat. Um, like, like, uh, Jason said, Will, we're so excited to have you and Kev in, in Houston next month. Um, and, uh, and can't wait, can't wait to see the performance and share it with, with everyone here in town. So thank you again Absolutely. so much for being here. Cool. Right. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Have a Enjoy wonderful that. day. You too, man. Peace. Well, I think that's about all we have time for today. Thanks to everyone for joining us virtually, for engaging with us during this conversation, and a huge thank you to our program sponsor, Westwood Trust. Big thanks to Will B. of Black Violin for making time to be here with us today 
And also thank you to DJ Flash Gordon Parks for being such a great interviewer. Make sure to save the date for Black Violin Impossible Tour on May 17th at 7.30 p.m. at Jones Hall. Tickets are available on our website. The link is in the description. We'll see you then.